Buonasera a tutti. Chiediamo scusa. Good afternoon, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, let me apologize for the delay, the uh, small delay compared to the original schedule, but this is a very important occasion and uh, we wanted to introduce a cultural project that involves our region and uh, all the different administration bodies. What you see here on the slide, it says Recanati, a candidate city for the, uh, as Italian capital of culture for 2018, 2018. So we have been waiting for the mayor of Recanati and uh, councillor for culture. We have been very active as Iguzzini in this project because, you know, we are rooted in this territory and uh, we can say that our cultural heritage is uh, of great value and we take the Italian culture, let's say, all around the world, 67% exports. So you as employees, as collaborators and stakeholders of this company in our territory, we can consider ourselves as ambassadors of culture. So Recanati has launched such a project. So Iguzzini, together with other entrepreneurs from the local territory, we are supporting this project. Of course, the day is dedicated to our very important special guest, David Adyaji, a young architect. Uh, Mr. Pippo Ciorra will introduce him in a second and uh, uh, he is actually part of the uh, project for Mr. Obama. Actually, he has a lot of many prestigious, important projects already made in many different countries of the world. So we will be happy to have David with us in order to listen to his presentation. He's a young man and, uh, you know, taking the best advantage of his own personal uh, experience, uh, his background, educational background background, professional background, I'm sure he will give us a great contribution to this cycle of conferences. So again, Ray Canati, this is, actually we have had several meetings, but uh, uh, we wanted to introduce the promotion of Recanati as a, a candidate uh, city, as I said, Italian Capital of Culture 2018, so this is the official launch of this project, and uh, this is another important appointment together with Maxi and the Polytechnic in Milan, so the enlargement, the inclusion of the Polytechnic of Milan, of course, brings additional value. We are in very close connection with the most important cultural centers in Italy, Maxi in Rome, the Polytechnic in Milan. So I will now introduce the mayor of Recanati. Just a very short introduction, but this is a very strong message we want to give you about the involvement you can all have and the importance of this project for our region. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to Recanati. Of course, our warmest welcome goes to our guests, prestigious guests. I will be very short. This is a project launched by the Marche government region regional government, so we are going to, we have 60 seconds, a very short video clip, it's about 60 seconds, this is the video we used uh, uh, during the expo in the Marca region pavilion, so let's watch it together.
bellezza, la bellezza so the beauty, paesaggi, the beauty of our landscape, of our territory, it is a very important presentation, a very important business car, let's say, and a presentation and a winning car that our country, Italy, should consider. So the good and the beautiful and also the capability we have to be extremely competitive, starting from the genius of this territory, the fact that we want to be uh, the capital, the Italian capital of culture. You know, we are just 20,000 people, but we are sure convinced that in very small places there is the possibility of creating a network of special personal relations. And this creates culture. This is an example of it, Iguzzini Illuminazione. It's a local company, but leader in the world. And uh, Iguzzini maintains a very fruitful relation, for example, with this territory. First of all, the education, the schools. And uh, today, in our system, it's important to start talking about the ideals, the value of education, the respect. We have to educate everybody to consider other people, the others, in a positive way. We have to start from such an important value. Today, for example, Iguzzini, a company like Iguzzini, investing in teaching activities in our territory with our schools, they support activities and they support social activities, they support sports activities. This is a great value for cultural growth because culture means to stay together in positive terms. Culture also means to invest in the wit, in the genius, in the talent, in the beauty. So the small Recanati world can represent everything. So first of all, our poet Giacomo Leopardi, his poesy, his poetry, his philosophy, and then Beniamino Gildi, Gigli, an opera singer, and then the Annunciation by Lorenzo Lotto, uh, a famous painter, but we also have uh, a representation in terms of industrial activities. All our activities are based on entrepreneurship, on the capability to look beyond, because, you know, the infinity is something, you know, you look beyond, let's say, you go beyond, and uh, that can be true for everything. Today we have uh, an important guest in terms of the architecture, world. So we want to present the greatest achievements of Recanati, the greatest, greatest results achieved by Iguzzini, but by many other companies. They have all started from creativity, from genius, from intuition. They have all started from the capability of using their intelligence and look beyond. This is, I would say, the original feature of the Recanati. Uh, town. We want to be uh, surprised because, as I said, the poet Leopardi, Leopardi the uh, singer Beniamino Gigli, and then Raphael in Urbino. But anyway, we have such a great texture in terms of creativity, talent. You know, as typical Italian, we have good and bad points, but we are sure that we can represent our nation, our country. So. We want you to support our project. This is a good project because it will let us grow as a territory. We want to choose culture. Our choice is culture, beauty, and tourism. I don't want to take any other space. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure we will enjoy the afternoon. As usual, thank you, Mr. Adolfo Guzzini, Mr. Massimiliano Guzzini, and thank you to the entire Guzzini company for your wonderful work in this project. Of course, thank you to my museum, the Maxi Museum. This is a, a happy project. We would say Felix in Latin. Anyway, it's mid-July. Uh, unfortunately, we are not on the beach today because also of the weather conditions, but it will be extremely important for us to have David Adyaji with us. David is a very important architect, is an architect of our time, 
as Adolfo said, for you know, it is very interesting in terms of uh, trajectory. He was born in Tanzania, then he was raised uh, in Ghana, then he went to London, he went to a school to study architecture, and then he completed his uh, background uh, and education in another school. So this is an example for our young people. Our young people are, you know, just learning how to mix uh, different uh, culture also uh, because of our university system, the three years plus two years for a complete course. Just like David did, this will help them to build a professional, very important uh, education. Uh, I know that David went to the Royal College of Art, that's a school for creativity that's a school for individual creativity and then he started to build uh, small houses black houses uh, houses where actually black was a, a kind of a dominant color so uh, it was almost everywhere and then by building and building houses David uh, had the possibility of working uh, with very important customers and this is a very another point for our young people you know when we were young everybody thought that you know the state uh, would give us job a job but this is no longer the Italian case so Italian architects have to start talking uh, with private customers they have to start setting up a dialogue dialogue they don't have to build residences but houses for people talking to people and working for people so David had uh, many important customers many important uh, artists in London he built many houses for glamour artists, glamour actors in London and some other places. And this was also an occasion for him to develop his artistic talent and artistic, uh, let's say, characteristics coming from his studies and from his original country, his homeland. So this has begun to come out not only in a residential project, but also in artistic installations. When we did not know David, we set up a, a small exhibition produced by the British Academy. We had it in the Casa dell'Architettura, in the architecture house of architecture and David had made an extraordinary installation with architecture architectural pieces they were very heavy more than 1,000 kilos we moved them around manually by hand so the capability of you know talking to people setting up a dialogue talking with the history of the local people and also integrating different cultures this is terribly important we have a terrible need of integrating different cultures. In 2005, for the first time, it took part at the Venezia Biennale of Architecture, and then 2008, he already started to have important exhibitions all over the world, and then he started to work on huge projects. So from British architect, he became a global architect. He will mention, for sure, a very important project, the National Museum of African and African American art that you are building just in front of the White House. So it's a very important issue and it's a beautiful project. Other important projects, contemporary museum, art museum in Denver, and then the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, a small of a small part of the uh, arbor where there is an ugly project by Renzo Piano, and also uh, an important uh, uh, institute, the Moscow School of Management in Moscow. So he is an architect that produces his own culture, but you know, carrying Africa around with him and integrating Africa in a very modern very much innovative European way. So now he is also uh, comparing himself uh, with many different locations in the world. You work in Africa the other day, the other night. They said, you know, maybe you're, somebody mentioned it, like saying you are neglecting Africa, but he has a firm a practice in Dakra, in London, in New York. So he is just bringing the African culture around. 
So the final surfaces with a perforation, with openings, uh, uh, they always let the light in. And this is a special issue for our friends, Guzzini. And also the people, the presence of the people, the country, the town. So we are extremely happy. Well, David, of course, is also a, a professor. He has been in Princeton, in Harvard. So he has also a lot of experience in terms of talking and learning and teaching uh, young people. So we are extremely happy. He is here. The other day we were in Rome. Of course, Rome is a kind of a disillusion somehow. It's a different town. And then the discussion was very cultural, very sophisticated on post-colonialism discussion. Today here, instead, we have young people, young lighting designers. I think it will be a great opportunity for them to see such a great architect and such a great architecture. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here at uh, the Guzzini um, headquarters. And um, it's wonderful to have a reception with the, the mayor um, and to meet Adolfo and to, to meet you. Um, thank you, Pippo, for making this happen. Um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, six projects from around the world in different regions, different locations, different lights. Um, and I love um, the fact that here at Guzzini you talk about light because this is my passion um, and really is at the heart of maybe the investigation that you'll see. The work is trying to look at what I'm calling the hybridity or the mutation of, of the types of architecture that helps the city, that helps the citizens in the city, and also maybe evolve new ways of looking at how architecture and the city can be related. And this is a, an important research for me um, and is really at the heart of uh, what I'm trying to do. Um, this is my office in London. Um, we converted it uh, and made it into a, an office uh, for my company. Um, as I said, we started in London, but we are now also in New York and in Accra in Ghana in Africa. Let's just go to the projects. Um, I'm going to start with um, a project which almost started my career. Um, really, it's the first project that really got me a lot of attention in London. And it's a house, a project that's called the Dirty House, but really it's not a house. It was really more like a studio um, and, and sort of home for two artists in the east end of London, in Shoreditch. Um, I don't know if you know it, but it's in a, a very important part of London, which has become very much the new regeneration area. Um, it was very much the factory um, industrial area of the city, which supported uh, the city for many centuries. And in the war, in World War II, it was bombed very heavily. And in the sort of late part of the 20th century, it became a very important area for artists to go to because it was cheap. You could get large spaces. And it was an opportunity to make modern architecture in a historic city. So a lot of young architects like myself, after we finished our education, moved to the East End and started to work with artists who were becoming very successful very quickly to create these projects. And it's really the context and the frame behind it. My, uh, the, my clients, who um, I knew when I was at university, they were also students at that time, um, bought this building, which was originally an old piano factory, which was converted in the 50s with lots of additions. It's a very much a hybrid, generic building. Um, and when we were given this building, the city said, fantastic, David, um, why don't you tear this down? Because in London, you have to get special permission, planning permission for, for making your work, um, uh, which is different to the US, of course, and Italy is the same sort of thing. But um, we said we were very interested not in destroying this generic hybridity, but to see if we could celebrate um, this quality. Now, this was very controversial then, because they, were, they, were, uh, they thought we were crazy. Um, but we said that there was something very interesting in just talking about the fabric of the city and to talk about the way in which you can add to the city and layer it. So the project became a way of working with the most mundane, um, maybe superficial, the thing you'd want to throw away and to see if you could create something from it. Um, in the end, the project was about, within, with, my, with my work, it really became about how to explore um, a way to make the architecture where the, the systems and the additions and the layers have a legibility and have a kind of precise condition, but also that the way in which the form, in terms of plan, arranges itself almost seems 
as I like to say, auto-generated. Auto it somehow seems to autonomously generate a natural kind of condition based on the, on the, on the program. Of course it's not, but it's the idea to try and make the plan so reduced that it almost looks like it was always somehow there. Um, the plan basically um, was to create um, a series of rooms that come together, that create a kind of spiral, really a corridor, an art space, a second art space, an office, and, and some services. And it allows the, the artists to come in and other people to come in in different ways, and then an upper level, which is a big living room with a large terrace with a view to the city. The section is probably the most important thing because you see how the building is, uh, is working. It's really, uh, the, the two artists, we wanted to try something new. It wasn't just about making a studio with light, but really to make the space a space for experimentation for the two artists in, in, in relation to the um, civic world. They wanted their studio not just to be a place to do um, to make art, but also a scale where they could rehearse how their art worked in institutional space. So we made a 22 uh, feet uh, box, which was the size of the Royal Academy in London, which was their ultimate ambition. So in a way, the building is almost like a prototype for their ambition. It shows it's a space to allow them to, show, to see how their work works in that sort of scale. And then up above, it's a half of that dimension, but totally transparent to the view of, of the city. So in a way, the city and the inspiration is really the kind of identity of this project. In the end, they were in a big show in the Royal Academy. So in the end, you know, the projection fulfilled the end game and the work looked spectacular there. This is the project, the same building um, with this uh, new layering. Now, the building is freezing all the banality of the existing uh, architecture and creating a new layer on the top and a new floating form which acknowledges the geometry of the box. The, so all the kind of um, deformations are simply covered in a resin uh, black sort of a coating. It's not really black, it's deep purpley brown and it's a, it's a material that's usually used for utility boxes to stop uh, graffiti and to stop people climbing onto these things. And we found that this material was very good in terms of creating a waterproof membrane for the skin of the building to protect the brickwork, which is very poor and cheap. Um, but it created this, this way of seeing the skin that became very interesting to me. Um, when you come in, you realize that actually the building has been shifted and this skin is really one part of the form and that there's a second elevation, which is this this here, and this really is the building inside the building. This is the facade. And as you go through it, you realize that there are different scales and geometries and different ways in which the light is being brought into the spaces. The architecture is reduced to absolutely very simple materials, concrete, plaster, wood. Um, and this is the scale of that studio, which is totally unnecessary as a normal studio, but you can, when you understand their work, you see why you need this incredible scale. It became the, the place to magnify their ideas, and it's, it's, it's fascinating, this idea of this projection. And some of the other studios are really about bringing light in in different ways, but also making views to courtyards. Uh, we made a small garden for them uh, in this space, and then up, into the upper level space. It's this open plan. Um, uh, you can probably tell the date of the project because of the lights, right? <laughs> Those of you here, <laughs> this is a different world. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, you know, a very, very uh, simple project where the, the wall is basically the structure for this roof. This is a glass wall with. Um, very thin steel rods between the glass to support and create the tension so that the, f the thing does not fall over. This braces the entire structure. So you get this incredible transparency and this lack of structure um, in the building and you get this relationship to the city, very high profile, sort of horizontal profile. And then this very high balustrade, which is really the height of my clients. And the reason was that they wanted it to be a place where they could privately sunbathe. 
So <laughs> they wanted to be naked. They wanted to be naked in their own house, which is very difficult in London, and they didn't want anyone to see them. So the balustrade is exactly their height. <laughs> so <laughs> so you, um, there's this kind of very interesting uh, kind of way in which the house is very much this personal set of systems for them. When, uh, and when it's, when it's nice in London, it opens up really beautifully. Um, and even the bedrooms at that time, this was 2002, it was the idea was to dissolve everything, to reduce everything. And then this is the house. You see on the ground plane, when we took out the old windows, we put mirror windows on the ground, and then we put deep windows up above, and then you have this floating section, almost like a chronology of different construction types. But we use mirror here because this was an area before the sort of gentrification of where a lot of prostitution was, actually. Um, and um, it was a very tough area to say that, but actually we did it as a kind of uh, discussion with our clients so that the, the women of the, of, the, of the night, or the people of the night, would have mirrors to care to dress themselves, to correct themselves. So there's a kind of irony in the project, which is not just about, um, you know, but it was very much, and it was very interesting at the beginning when we finished, that we'd have, we'd have the incredible messages on the windows written in lipstick saying thank you, or it was fascinating. People really understood exactly what the thing was. <laughs> so then up above the house is, um, at lit, there's no lights apart from the, the strip lights, and most of the light comes from indirect floor lighting. This white floor illuminates the house, and you get this beacon at night. And this beacon became very famous in the neighborhood, um, because in the evening, this roof would glow. And it really became one of the houses that really started a kind of, sort of, uh, a sort of new way of looking at this, uh, this part of the city with this terrible, apparently terrible architecture. And, um, and maybe a way to reuse it. Um, I'll move across the world to Korea and to talk about a, a very special project that I did, a very small project, but one which has huge impact for me. So Korea, this part of the world, the city, um, and Guangzhou is the city with an incredible river that splits into two. Our site is here. The project was really uh, commissioned by the Guangzhou Biennial, which I don't know if you know about it. It's a very important architectural biennial in Asia where the architecture of the biennial is not temporary. Every, every uh, two years, a selection of architects and artists are brought together and they make projects which are paid for by the city and the projects are permanent. They don't go away. So it's a very interesting idea. So the idea is to make infrastructure for the city using collaboration between creative people and architects. And uh, the curator always sets up a theme. And uh, uh, in, uh, in this year, it was about literature and democracy. We became very fascinated. Uh, we, this is uh, Nicholas Hirsch, who was the director of that year. And I became very fascinated wor with working with this woman, Taye Selassie, who's become a very important West African American writer. Um, talking about migrations and, and different um, sort, of, uh, sort of ways in which different communities interact and, and grow up in different worlds. And I wanted to collaborate with her to make a pavilion, and we thought a lot and decided we wanted to make a new kind of library. Uh, we said we wanted to make a library um, only because in Guangzhou, the book is very important. Uh, people are very, very... Um, um, have a reverence for literature. Even the newspaper doesn't get thrown away. It gets folded very nicely and put on a chair for somebody else to read. You never throw it away. You give, you read a book. If you finish and you don't want to keep it in your house, you give it to somebody. So there's this incredible culture that we found that was very soft, but very, very powerful. And we said we wanted to make a new kind of building that maybe could celebrate this. As well, if you know Asian cities, which are hyper cities of infrastructure, there are these moments where, you know, on sort of a piece of infrastructure which takes you down to the river, they build these memories because Korea was bombed so heavily. They build these memories of what Korean life was about. The idea of the idyllic sitting and watching water, sitting by um, a pastoral or a beautiful view. So it's funny because they, it's made out of these reconstructions which are slightly fictitious and they're placed in these hyper conditions. But we thought that this was very interesting and maybe the combination of this infrastructure and this could give us an idea of what this library could be. We'd propose a library with no walls, but a library as an infrastructure at the junction of the river. 
The library is basically at the end of a stone bridge to cross the river, and this is this form. We propose a cube, which is basically a staircase to bring you from this level down to the water. Now, this river, this is at the low tide, but it also floods. So the structure has to be able to kind of support um, flooding and, and also the dry season. So it's both, it's, it's a library, it's a gateway, it is a moment to reflect and look, and it is a place to perform and, act, and to activate. We made a structure, so the staircase became this double-sided form, um, and then we made a cross uh, set of columns with erosions in it for books, and this whole area became a plinth, like a podium, for events and performances. This is Wi-Fi and allows uh, events, and it's looked after by the public library. Up above it, we made a timber structure, a very simple structure, which made a cross vault, which is trying to kind of speak to the kind of cultural tradition. So you have this double structure, the concrete and the timber, um, creating this new, this new landscape. This is the plan of the roof. The roof is really made out of very simple timber that's just um, taken through an action, a moment. It's the same dimension, just rotated in different ways to make the cross vault. So it's, it's about trying to create a craft without a sort of special skill, but just using technology to make it. So you can see the hypercity of this Asian condition, and this is the volume here. Um, this is the river with a very low tide, and this is the bridge to the moment. So we made this, this, this condition here. We love this moment because people use it for exercise and walking and just to be away from the density of the city to be in this incredible uh, moment of nature. The, the structure sits like this and can flood up to this level. The water can come right up to here. So there are moments when this cannot be here. So this, this project, we haven't seen that flood. That's a 150-year flood. But when it happens, it will be an extraordinary moment. <laughs> So the form is basically this, this thing, which is basically a staircase. But then, of course, it's more than that. It's also a way to talk about this end condition and to talk about this, uh, in this moment. This allows for performance and readings, a lot of poetry readings and uh, things now happen here. Old people do their walks, come and leave their uh, magazines. Um, the, the mayor makes events and now does you know, announcements by the water as a result of this structure. It never used to happen. It was always in buildings. Um, sort of see details of that, that structure. Let me just see if I can get those a book. Yep. Mm -hmm. Close-ups. 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 You can see when the books are in, how the structure and the books, the books come out. They, they float. And this is very important that this, this mood is created where the book becomes this special object. And then this idea of this timber, which is very simply stained, catching the light, and then creating this atmosphere. It's kind of this intimate atmosphere that overlooks the water, framing it with these four arched views. And then the city always builds these by this bridge. So they left this and they wanted, they said, should we take it down? And we said, no. <laughs> We wanted to somehow have this dialogue of these two worlds. It's a little bit of a, you know, a, a thing. But this idea that this, these two systems are somehow like playing with each other. And then you can see the hyper condition of the city. And then this relationship, this peace in, in the center. Let me move to America. And let me talk to you about a very ordinary, a real library. But a, new, a real library in the 21st century with a new uh, condition. This is in Washington um, on the East Coast, the capital city. And what's interesting about this neighborhood, which is a sort of low uh, working class neighborhood, is this very beautiful um, amount of forest, natural forest, that was not manicured. This is not a park, but this is the old forest that actually the city just kind of preserved and built the suburbs next to it. What's, in America, this is very unique because it very rarely happens. Usually, this would be a manicured landscape. Um, certainly, for sure, in Europe, it would definitely be that. So it created a very unique condition. And the city 
understanding and rethinking libraries from a project that I did um, in 2002 also to reinvent the local library as not just a library but a place for community gathering, for birthdays, for, um, for political events, for teaching lifelong learning, which is a very important thing that education doesn't stop at 18 or 25, but that you're continually learning, that you're learning all the way to the end of your life, especially with the modern world. Um, so that the library becomes a place where you have classes continually going on, teaching you language, teaching you computer skills, teaching you program applications, teaching you literature. This idea that the, this, the library is more than just a depository of books, especially in the digital age, but is a place of collective gathering and exchanging of information is now very important. So this Washington, looking at London, where we built um, eight of these, also commissioned you know, something like 16 libraries, rebuilt or refurbishing. Um, we did two of them, these two. And the program is, is very interesting, that the investment is that you make in a very normal community, this is our site, the kind of housing in that area, um, a, 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 an architecture that, um, that can be more than just a, a place for you know, homework and books, but really a community center. In the end, that's how I, I sort of see it. I became fascinated by plant life because of the, the relationship to the forest, which I found so compelling, that this literally, and I'll show you later pictures, you go 10 meters in and you are lost. Um, I thought that there's something very interesting about the DNA of plants um, and this idea of a kind of uh, being able to make out of a standard unit m uh, a lot of variety and form and perception. And you know, some of the kind of plant life that demonstrates that are ferns and obviously sunflowers. But just it's really, it's in all plant life, but it's really to demonstrate this kind of this ability of a simple uh, geometry and the tessellating power of it. So I wanted to make a very, what looked like a very simple building, but had this bespoke quality in the way in which it was made. But obviously it was not bespoke. This is a very standard city budget. The building was basically to make a very large glass hall, but to divide it into three zones. And the three zones are um, a library entrance area, a reading room media area, and then closed teaching spaces, which are, goes down from groups to smaller groups to single individuals with a teacher. So it's really these three strips. And then two zones, or rather three zones also this way, which is entrance, which is like an atrium and circulation, middle, which is services, and then the back, which is the great room to the forest. Up above, there's a children's library, specifically made with a sleeping pod for toddlers, for babies. And then here we have a room, which is a flexible room for teaching classes, for uh, uh, events, for lectures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the, the ceiling is a, a large roof, which deals with solar shade, and then the building has a services building underneath it. It has a podium, and then you have basically this room, and then this hanging volume, which is the children's space and the special room. This is the building off the street. And when you look at it, you think it's a glass building, of course. It's actually only 35% glass. Um, it's highly energy efficient. It's a gold Leeds building. When you come close, you start to see what is going on. Each panel of glass is a different geometry. It grows vertically and it expands horizontally. The units are perceptively moving, and there's a reason for it, which I'll show you. The podium, which is flush with the ground here but becomes lifted here, is totally permeable so that it's actually allowing stormwater to go through it. There is no sort of impact on the, the weather system so that nature is coming right to the ne next to the building. And then as you come close, you see that the building you think is glass also has this incredible depth and reflection at the same time, almost like a contradiction of what you expect the curtain wall to be. When you come in, you see what's going on. It becomes these plywood, uh, pylons, these forms that create a room, a wood room, um, a tr almost like a tree house as I call it, and then the circulation. And then in the main room you see these apertures, they become more horizontal, that frame the views to the, uh, to the forest. And then in the cellular spaces for, for, for different learning classes, for adult education, etc., you then, uh, there's still transparency and a relationship to the context. Even in the group ones where they're circular, we use glass to kind of create the enclosure so there's always a connection. And you can see the condition between these, these forms. 
And then sort of the main rooms where you suddenly have more verticality and a sort of moment of double height where you know, there's a much more convivial sort of social space. There, in the entrance area, you have a skylight which dissolves the light and plays with the, with the way in which you see the forest and, and the way in which you see the lights. And then up to the children's library where you have these uh, little bedroom, little bed spaces for children to be in niches um, around the perimeter of the building to be able to look at the forest but also be in comfort. And then windows for children to look through. And then you see this idea of the forest when you come through it. Um, you realize this is 10, 15 meters in. This is the edge of my building. You're in this forest, which is virgin and real. Um, the playground structures are here. This is the form here. But the minute you go in, the reflectivity starts to dissolve the building. And this is what I wanted, to see if you could make a building that just could dissolve in this forest. The canopy is the only device left that almost becomes the acknowledging plane of the form. And even in the winter, it totally disappears. And it disappears not by effect, but simply because of the fact of where it is and the condition. So this is not a manipulated picture. You go and people always say, wow, the building is not here. And it's because we made no expression on the facade. So really, this, the, the surface can be sheer when you're right next to it. And then at night, you get the geometry shapes and the change from wide to very vertical happening. So you see this kind of architecture that is trying to kind of speak about this condition, but also make a new topology for this community. It's one of now the most used spaces in, um, in, in that community. It's become incredibly successful. And this is just from making investment in this infrastructure in these communities. I'm going to move to um, a project in New York, our first big project in New York, um, in Harlem, um, the upper part of New York. This is the sort of rivers as they come round. And um, Harlem, if you don't know, this is, this is actually New York in the north. It's hard to believe, but this is what it used to look like only 150 years ago. So the top end, this area, which is this incredibly dense area, used to look like this. And people in uh, New York would go from this downtown up here to be in the countryside in this. Um, and it's amazing how it's completely changed. Of course, you know, this, was the, this is Harlem now this incredible architecture and density, terraces, mansion blocks, housing. My, and also, this area became an important first ghetto, but now community for the African-American community and for most of the immigrants that were coming that weren't very much in the white world, but uh, were, were, wanted to find a, a kind of place in the center. Also, for African-Americans coming from the south, from segregation, this was a very important part of the city and in a way created an incredible explosion of black excellence in music and culture and created a lot of the music that in America that we know, rock and roll, et cetera, all happened here. Duke Ellington, Little Richard. These are the places where they really flourished and, and came to their own. This place in the architecture that's made also somehow embedded within it this architecture of plant life. So the original, the original plant um, agrarian quality somehow is still embedded in the architecture of the area. We made full surveys of the entire neighborhood to understand this and we really came away saying this is the predominant thing that is uh, an incredible quality. So we wanted to find a way to, in our own way, find a way to make uh, a 21st century acknowledgement of this important tradition. And we discovered that in our area, in our site, that there was a very important uh, uh, rose gardens. <laughs> and um, it's funny how the roses are very beautiful, but obviously it's seemingly unconnected thing to architecture. But I became very interested in the fact that the rose is also um, a kind of a flower that has a lot of uh, popular folklore in terms of music of Aretha Franklin and all these people. There's always this discussion about roses and concrete and you know, this idea of kind of the delicacy of the flower and the power of, you know, and the, and the power of the city. I became really fascinated with seeing if we could use this rose to do something. We, uh, I'm going to talk about the building specifically because it has a specific agenda, but the, the, the building's nature, its facade, I said, could we make a building with a new type of skin which plays with this notion of this embossed, an embossed rose in concrete that would be a vector drawing. It's a vector drawing, so it's basically a way in which the, you use a computer to make a, a sort of a marks on the facade of concrete and the aggregation of the marks makes an image for you. 
But because it indents negatively, you don't see it in the sun. You see it when there's a bleak sun, a bleak light against it, or when it rains, ironically, when it's actually damp, or when it's sort of not in bright light. So it reverts exactly in reverse to the 19th and 20th century. Um, this is the, the, the samples that we made. It's just this indentation that creates, when you go back, the optic of the rose. Um, and this is the building in its context. The building is sitting at the edge of a, a sort of main urban block, very close to the water. And it has four sides, but four different elevations. So um, we made a building which basically has four sides to it. It addresses the upstate New York, downtown New York, the east and the west, very specifically, because it's really like an object. It's not sitting in a terrace. It's sitting as a singular element in this form. So the, the shape of this building and the profile became very important. The building is basically a, a housing center, a housing startup center for homeless people. It's for people who have no homes, and it's, founded, it's, a, it's a project for an incredible group uh, in the city who, wanted, who believe that housing is the critical way to move people out of poverty, of course, because you have an address, you can have, um, from that address, you can apply for jobs, you can become a citizen, you can pay taxes, you can become part of the community. So this idea of creating housing by any means necessary to get people out of ghettos, out of conditions, seems to be, for them, the primary way to alleviate poverty. The project um, with the city, we discussed, a way to make not just housing, but um, housing plus a cultural facility to say that in this place where people would normally stigmatize this community and say, ah, oh, this is the worst people, so put them somewhere we don't want, we put in, uh, instead, the best creche we could make for children. For 125 kids, a fantastic creche, learning the best lessons, brought a, a great school there, and a storytelling museum, um, a cultural museum for children, for all the schools of New York to be able to come to this building and to learn uh, what they call storytelling through art. So it became, at the same time, this building which is supporting this incredible and important infrastructure for the community generally. So it played this balance between these two worlds. The building is, the plan again, as I said about my plans, are as you think they should be based on the tight site. It's a series of bars. One bar is the, uh, the creche, which wraps around the facade and gives views, residential in the center, and the museum, which takes the third part around a light courtyard, which gives you light into the center. A very simple podium with a courtyard. Um, lower levels, enjoying that. And then upper levels, a bar, which is double-loaded corridor apartments, which then um, flip over to create the second profile. And the reason for the second profile is this idea of a, a way in which to make the architecture not just singular or face one way, but to be a multi-directional form. The elevations I'll show you very quickly are very simple. Windows where there are apartments, ribbons where there are public program. And then you can see the elevation change between one side and the other. I'll go through it quickly. And then the building in its context. So this is the building here on this very interesting triangular block. And then let's just go to it from the street. It's, it's a very low budget building, but a very important project. This is the street context where it has in Harlem, these beautiful stepping sort of blocks, which I really loved. And uh, I, I talked about this idea that in the city already are all the answers to the complexity of hybridity. So we talked about, could we also make a stepping in our building, which is around the corner, and create a relationship to the river? And this is then the space for the, 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 um, the crash. So when, as you come past and you go down a hill, the crash is this glass form, which shows you all this program, and then the mass of the, the building up above. The plaza becomes a space for the market, which we negotiated with the city. So the city now has a three-day market in front of the building, which allows this community to get access to fresh food, but also for this, the community also to have a, a farmer's market right in their, in their, in their community. The creche has the best views. Usually children's uh, spaces are protected because you're worried about adults, but because of that elevation change, you're able to allow the, stu the, the children to get the best views of the city and to have the best light. Um, we designed everything for them, the tables, etc., the bathrooms with supervision. The whole thing is kind of curated to work really precisely to support this. 
And then there's the museum. And then the museum, as you come down, you look down, and you're going down 40 feet, and you don't realize it, but there are these light shafts that bring us light right down into the building. And when you're at the bottom, you're in these um, sort of spaces for teaching. And then this is the bottom of that corridor, which divides the main art space and creates a, a street with this light for the classrooms to be able to break out and not disturb the other side, which is this room. And then on the third side, um, exhibitions of art um, where the students learn and, and see real works and then also then go and do education projects based on it. So it's become a very important curriculum uh, space for uh, the community and for the city to be able to program and talk about art and, and, and community. And then the residential into a very simple corridor, uh, simple uh, corridors for the apartments, and then the apartments. And these are the first homes for people who've not had homes. So it's interesting, we took these pictures, or these, and half of them that were sent to us, of people decorating their houses for the first time, and thinking they would never have a home, and then having a home. And so we made these shells, and it's amazing to see how people appropriate these spaces. And I love showing these images because for me it's not about the control, but the way in which people inhabit and use the container of the architecture in different ways. This is what we gave them, a, a sort of a, a bamboo floor, um, a kitchen open, and the windows. <laughs> And then this idea of the facade, because you think the building is, is strong, it's quite brutal, yes. But then when you come close, the light, you start to see something else. And you realize that actually, depending on the angle, you get these flowers appearing. And they appear and disappear in, in, this, in this sort of monolithic block. So as you come close, sometimes children always point out, oh my god, I can see something, or not. And it becomes this kind of way in which you see ornament in a new way on a building. So like, right, for instance, here you think there's nothing, but that's just to do with the way the light is hitting the building. And then suddenly, it's at dusk, it becomes deeper. That's a kind of soft kind of game. And then let's go to another part of the world. Let's go to Beirut. Um, Beirut, Lebanon, if you don't know it, it's in the Mediterranean, that, that end of it. And it was, you know, is one of the most beautiful peninsulas um, in the Mediterranean. Um, I really have such affection for the city. This is the main center and the harbor. And this is my site. <laughs> this is Beirut from the 20s to the 60s before the war. They had a very large war in uh, the 60s, you know, very similar to the kind of wars that we're having in different parts of the world, um, which more or less halted the city for you know, 30 years, 27 year war. But this was in my father's time, he talked so much about how beautiful the city was. I was here when I was 10 years old. Uh, we lived in Beirut at that time. So I have these also these kind of incredible memories of this place. This is Beirut now after the reconstruction, an incredible city um, right next to Syria. So really fragile, but still trying to not give up and trying to become you know, still a place for people, even though it's right on this edge of this incredible instability of war. Um, my client was an amazing client who decided not to, you know, there's a lot of money he, he was investing, not to invest in a, a foreign place, but to still invest in a city, even though, you know, potentially his building could be, um, you know, could be it could be part of uh, an agenda which would make, make him lose his investment, really. Anyway, this is a kind of part of Beirut where there are a lot of factories, and this is very private. This is a very main road, which is a six-lane highway, but it's right next to the ocean. It's a fantastic part of the city, but nobody sees it normally. Um, and so he basically bought this land um, and decided to build a retail environment, but not just retail, but um, also an exhibition. He's one of the biggest collectors of digital art, um, so art um, from the mid-90s to now. He's one of the biggest collectors of contemporary digital, digital art. And, and then to also make a wellness center, a place for health and well-being, 
and also to make the first, uh, this is a suggestion that we made when we came, to make a public plaza for the community because there are very little public spaces, very few public spaces in, in Beirut. So we said because he could afford this, we, would, uh, we asked the city to build out this land, this is a landfill, to create a very large plaza, almost the same footprint as the building, for the public that is free. Um, the building is very orthogonally um, organized. It's a box with a skin around it, and then the plaza is a series of jetties that go to it. We, we had to kind of make the entrance here, so we just there's one diagonal in the plan. Uh, the program, this cross program, is very simple. Yellow is the museum, which is uh, uh, as big as the Whitney. It's almost a Whitney-sized museum in this building. It's just to give you the scale. <laughs> um, this is retail, which is blue. And then uh, red is the wellness and uh, restaurants in the building. So it's almost like a little, it's like a castle. But it's a city. It's a small city with its own plaza. Um, we basically, in plan, divided it into three, an atrium, two blocks, and then a skin system which would then um, deal with the, the kind of condition of the Middle East, which is this incredible solar game. And we developed a skin with this very intricate uh, weave, like a mahrabiya, which is a traditional um, uh, Middle Eastern idea for dealing with shade, but allowing you to see through. And it was really designed for women's spaces to be able to see, but there was something very beautiful about the idea of making a building which is an entire mahrabiya, which would talk about this view, this, this, uh, this system which would acknowledge what this type of building would be. And then inside is a reverse of the skin as a reflection system in that atrium. The plans are very simple, but essentially that's the, that's the museum, that's the retail. This is the second building which is being built now. Uh, and then the section. The section is, is there. This moment where you see the second system inside the system. This is the museum, and the museum is very simple. It's two double height cubes, which are nearly uh, 30 feet. They're actually 28 feet. And then two smaller 14 foot uh, chambers, and they overlook the main space. And then they're connected on two levels to the retail space. This is the building in this context. So you can see this highway. Nobody would cross this. Nobody would go here. This is the industrial area. Nobody even knows that, you know, the, that there's an accessible ocean behind here. So this building, this is normally the vernacular. This is the difference to that vernacular, and it's a deliberate idea. And then it rotates to kind of create this condition of you know, falling out of the plane here and opening up to the ocean at the back. So this is our building, uh, just here. This is it in the street. We're working with the city to make also a bridge here to be able to get people from this part of the city directly to it. At the moment, the only way is to come by parking, but this is part of the way in which to start to kind of destroy this extraordinary kind of infrastructure of, of, of the city. So here is this moment of this entry. This is it from the street. This is a very dangerous photograph. <laughs> Standing literally in the middle of the street. And then the entrance, so up to the foundation, up to the retail, and down to the cars. So there's three things are happening at the one spot. <laughs> Entry inside, retail, incredible, you know, da la la. <laughs> Restaurants. And then you go into the main space of the retail. This is the atrium, which is the negative space. And you come into this world in the middle of the plan and you don't know what's happening. But it's the same drawing of the facade. And the facade basically becomes a way of talking about light and shadow, permanent or not. And this is a real image where you use reflection and, uh, uh, and natural light and artificial light to create this kaleidoscope that brings you from those spaces to the retail spaces. And then at the top, you start to see the light emerge, and you come out of it, and you see the kind of difference between these two systems. And then you, at the top, you realize that it's really natural light and artificial light mixing together to create these reflection spaces. Even in the shops, you have these moments where you have these windows that we made just to frame. And then the outside, you see this form. And the form is really about the Red Sea, about this history of Beirut, 
um, which was a city with red roofs originally. But I wanted to make this red system, a, a sort of pixelated movement, um, which is then layered in different thicknesses to create shadow and light and, and, and a, new, a new type of skin. Through the retail, this is a little electronic door, and it goes through, and you're in. And you're here, right next to Peponi, you know, one of the greatest Italian sculptors, right there on the other side. Um, and then you can go back into retail, but I will take you around a different way. You come in through the entrance. The entrance is totally neutral, no finishes, as opposed to the other world. Completely austere. And then you go up, elevators or stairs, and you enter this. So then you're in the gallery space. This is the double height space, uh, which is 28 feet. This was a door into the retail. And you can see this is a show, Wade Guyton, Rich Gehad Richters. You know, it's an extraordinary space where people in uh, the Middle East, but in Beirut, can see some of the best art in the world, including Lebanese art, but really the best art in the world in this place. And then the upper levels, the views down, we use a structural glass wall so you can get right close to them. Martin Bass, Richard Prince. And then you have a space to be able to reflect and look at the ocean. You know, sometimes it's open, sometimes it's screened. And also to be able to look back at the city. This is the window looking towards Byblos. So the main city, the main staircase for the museum looks towards Byblos, and I don't know if you know what Byblos is. Byblos is probably one of the oldest cities left in the world, 5,000 years old, which is still active. And then this is the plaza being finished for the public, um, and you see how the building rotates and opens up. And this is the reclaimed uh, shoreline that we made, which is being planted, and it becomes this incredible space that you can just come to around the building or through the building and you have this incredible space to, this, to the city. So this, when it's finished, it's just finishing, will be this, this space for the city, which, and also will have a sculpture program, a running track, etc. And this is the project here. So you can see the scale of this thing. And then I will leave you with my last project. This is the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a very important project that I've been working on for eight years. Um, and it's finishing this year. It's opening in September with uh, four, four presidents from America, four past presidents of Obama, Clinton, um, and the Bushes. Um, so it's going to be a fascinating security uh, experience. <laughs> we don't even know if we will get in <laughs> because <laughs> it's too many things, but um, we're excited that uh, it's creating a lot of um, energy at the moment. And it's, um, it's a very special uh, competition that we were, it really changed my career that I won. Um, and really it's to build the last possible building on the Washington Mall. The center of Washington is the monumental mall, um, and the mall was designed 200 years ago with a series of cultural buildings that were to talk about the, the culture of the nation, and this is the last one. So it was a very incredible honor, and of course it is, last but not least, it's a, a museum dedicated to the African American community and their contribution to the identity of America. And this is a new kind of museum because it's not a museum with beautiful objects. It's not a museum which is saying, here is the most precious thing or here is not. It's a museum about stories, about how people contribute to nations and how nations are made stronger through the diversity of their groups and what those stories are. So this is a, a unique kind of building where the Smithsonian has embarked on creating a building where the things may not be precious to you and I, a Bible of a slave, um, the dress of a very important person that sat on a bus to resist arrest, um, the shackles of slavery. Um, these, are, these are things which help the story. And what this museum does is, is to, it's to collect original objects and artifacts and to use them to tell the story. Now, a quick summary, this, the, this narrative of slavery, which is a 300-year sort of project, really took slaves, 12 million slaves from this area, 
over 300 years, between West and Central Africa. And of course, nine million slaves went to South America. You know? So really, the southern coast of South America, as we know, is really very much a relationship with the continent. Three million slaves um, went to um, the Caribbean, which is the second densest area, and only uh, 400,000 went to America. So we all talk about America and its slave history, but actually America was the least kind of dense slave market. <laughs> it actually happened mostly in South America and the Caribbean. And it's amazing how this community of uh, 400,000 are now 40 million in America. 100, 150 years later, it's a community of, of 40 million. Um, and so when you look at the story that way, you understand that this is a story of tragedy, but also of incredible um, a struggle and also incredible um, uh, kind of uh, uh, ability. That this community, which comes from West Africa, is able within 150 years to become such an important group within this, this, uh, this country. Um, we wanted to make a museum that wasn't just a palace, a building with artifacts in it, because we'd said this was a very different sort of thing. We wanted to make a museum which would be, in its very nature, part of a story. So I started the story in my research on this project uh, looking at the highest cultural group in West and Central Africa, and they were the Yoruba. The Yoruba were this incredible artisanal group um, from the 14th century, actually from the 10th century right on, their roots, their empire started. But what they did really well was to create artifacts that memorialize different kings and different stories. And the way they would do it would be to make karyatids with stories, key tropes of the story embedded, um, and then to make these crowns, which were the kind of upper systems for holding the tops of the buildings. And I became very fascinated with these crowns. And the crowns depicted or used for, were used for different layers of the story. I also became very interested in looking at African-American labor because in the, in the story of slavery with African-Americans, you only hear of you know, cotton picking and farming, but actually slaves were building canals, were designing structures, bridges, they were making architecture, they were ironsmiths. All this work was done by uh, slaves who learned these skills um, and actually became, in, when they were freed, became the first industries that they were, went into. Um, this is Charleston, where they have now acknowledged that this contribution of this architecture is part of the identity of the southern coast, but it's really a, a slave architecture that was made for their masters. Um, our site is an extraordinary site. This is the Washington um, uh, Mall. The, mon the mall is here. Congress is here. This is the White House. This part is for monuments. This part is for culture. This is for the White House, its grounds. It's called the Oval. So it kind of makes this monumental cross, and we are right here. Uh, this is uh, Washington's great monument, and, uh, and in our analysis of the site, we said there were nine important views, looking at the White House, the National Archive, the Mall, et cetera, et cetera, Lincoln, Jefferson, uh, et cetera. And we, we said that this building has to have nine windows, nine windows to the city. And, and the, with this idea of the profile and these nine windows, we would use the, the architecture would start to speak to uh, the relationship to the city and to the content. The building, in the end, became a building within a building. It is, a, um, again, uh, a building which creates a filtering system for a glass building inside with an opaque building inside that. There's three layers. It's a cube, 210 feet. Um, cube, which sits exactly in line with all the palaces, but moves away from the back and puts 50% of its accommodation underground. That we sort of did because we discovered that this was a slave market here. And in the way we distributed and wanted to design the spaces, we talked about wanting to make the history galleries, there are three parts to the museum, history, the migration from slavery to the cities, and now. So it, is, it has a tripartite um, organization, which is our job. So one, we said, should be underground, and two, above ground. So really, uh, logistically, a little bit crazy, but we thought, felt that it was very important that that history gallery was right underneath this space. 
This is the plan of the site. It's five acres of site. So this is the back infrastructure and then the museum space here. And then on the plan, this is the main space. The entrance is basically a room with no exhibit, but a space with four lights, north, south, east, and west. Um, and then the westerly um, elevation is where the circulation is, uh, and the north is where the main atrium is, getting the least amount of direct sunlight. Then up above, you have exhibition floors and then offices. And this is the section looking at the building next to the Washington Monument um, and looking at the kind of scale of the building. This is 80 feet underground. This is the section looking at the spaces. This is the uh, main part of the building. This is the history space here. This is the history gallery with this monumental space, which I'll talk about in a second. And then this special dedication room, which uh, is above this history gallery, which finishes the journey. And then you go up to these exhibition spaces, and then you get a view. The skin of the building is this triple, triple, um, triple sort of uh, tiered uh, reference to that Yoruba crown. We looked at a Charleston um, piece of cast iron and really used the computer to just look at all the geometry, the geometrical collisions between horizontal and vertical to create a matrix, very simple matrix, which we densified or thinned to respond to the light from the north to the south. Then we used that to pixelate the form to create transparency, red, and opacity, purple, around the nine lens window systems and also the circulation of the escalators and where you get moments where you get views through the transparency of the skin. So that then the form of the building is like this. These are the elevations with these view windows to Abraham Lincoln, to the mall, with a kind of very large porch which introduces you into the building. And then this is a sample of the facade. We made the facade out of cast aluminium with a bronze coating on it. And so it is really a thickness. Um, and you can see it when it's up. It's really a thick, deep um, structure that basically is, um, we wanted not to use a laser cut, but to use this old tradition. It's still, it's a sand cast that was the same as they were doing 300 years ago. So it's kind of just, repeating the process but using the modern age um, to create this, this, new, this new skin. We tested it for lights, light pollution and perforation because at night we want the building to have a soft glow to it, to defy its uh, opacity. And then this is the building in its context. I like this winter view because you see it completely exposed. This is the canopy when it's finished, and it creates this moment of reflectivity. There's light, because this is south, we're using the light to create dapples always on the ceiling when the sun is out, so that when you're coming in, you're getting this cooling effect. This angle and this water reduces the summer temperature by eight degrees at the beginning of the building. So we create this very cool space, and those of you who've been to the mall, this is one of the hottest, most terrible places in the summer. People are just sort of sweltering. So we wanted to make our building have this kind of cool welcome. Um, you can just come to this garden and wait if you want before going on without going in. Then when you come into the, this is the structure about six months ago. When you come in, you come into this dark ceiling, which then allows you to look at this, the light of the four directions because you get four lights. And then you go down to the lower section this is the history galleries being made. And every object in here, from this is a slave cabin, this is the trains of segregation, there's the Angola Fort. Every object has been collected from all over America and around the world. So each one will take you through the story of, of these people. We had to put the train in first before we finished the building. It can never come out. So it was vacuum packed, put on a thing, closed down Washington, lowered it in. And you will be able to take that train and see the segregation train relationship. We recreated the platform that you get in. And then there are going to be these incredible exhibitions, uh, reenacting the lunch counter, using the state of our technology to really talk about uh, the history. And then there's this Oculus, 
which is where the slave market used to be, where there's this reverse waterfall. And the reverse waterfall is a moment after the history galleries to reflect and to think before you go on. And it also acknowledges this moment um, on, on, on the site. This is a kind of moment there when you finish your journey. This is without the glass. And this is the form here. At the beginning, when you come to the building, you'll be able to look down into that waterfall. And it becomes a lens that's uh, a beacon on the northern, northern side of the site. When you come through that, you see this void. And you look through to the windows and the light. And you see this incredible stair that brings you down to the lower concourse level. which is uh, This is going down 40 feet. And it's a single span cantilever. It's black steel. You have no view as you go in it, except for when you get to the bottom and it reveals itself. The auditoriums. Then when you go up into the gallery, you can see how the skin works with the light and how it makes this extraordinary um, sort of space. And then the windows, which sometimes have a curation around it to frame the views. This is talking about the military. Washington was a famous general, the first president of America, and how the African-American community is very much part of the military of America. And this is, we had to kind of use computers to simulate it and to kind of make sure we could get it, and we got it framed. And this is that window back. Sport. And then finally, that top view, which gives you a panorama over the entire mall. And then the terrace, the roof terrace, which gives you a view right to Virginia, to Maryland. This is just looking at different lighting effects. It becomes incredibly graphic in there sometimes. And this is all in the public circulation area, which is encouraging you to want to explore. And then the whole building, the skin is held back from the main building by these pins which connect it. And the outer skin is almost like a shield for the building. This is a kind of close-up of the skin in the sun from the street, the planting that's happening now. The angle of the building is the same as the top of the Washington Monument. So it's 17 degrees. And then from different parts of DC, you see it. It sometimes is very dark or sometimes very golden, depending on where the light is. And then in the evening, it becomes this lantern. OK, thank you. I've taken enough of your time. It was a great presentation. Thank you. I think everybody loved it. Are you ready to take questions? Uh, absolutely. Avete qualche domanda? Okay, so my question is about the Harlem project. The building. No, I can I ask you about no. the Harlem project if uh, yeah. the building in it seems to be divided in there are two buildings uh, in, in the section it seems but mostly in, in the two. last I, I, my, the question is is mm, i don't <laughs> understood yeah. if, uh, if there are just terraces on the upper level or, or there is a kind of a street in the sky a second street uh, up in, in the, the second th level in the harlem building uh, if, uh, in the harlem project yes, yes. Sorry. Because it, it, also the brutality of the project and this obsession, not obs obsession, obsession. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, of not repeating, not making yes. um, uh, a singular Correct. brutal vol volume, and plus the, this idea to multiplicate connections, yeah. like in, in the street, it seems a memory of the Smithsons, of yes. the Team 10, also the var variety of this, I don't know if... I if your work is in that tradition, because they were doing social projects mostly, like the Armland project is. So I make it's a, a kind of piece of England in the New York. Can I uh, make a confession? I was taught by Peter. <laughs> I was taught by Peter Smithson. <laughs> no, I know you didn't know. Most people don't. Peter taught me in my last year at the Royal College. So um, I'm, I'm very much love this work and this idea of a kind of taking the city and making it part of um, how architecture operates. So yes, there are these moments which are about creating courtyards or about creating streets and about taking, using the brutality but also disrupting it 
with urban ideas. It's very much what's going on. So when you're looking at that building, that upper level, we definitely deliberately put in a program that brings people up to that upper terrace and gives you this view. But it's where you do your laundry, where you meet people, where you do, you know, so the, the banal program is celebrated on, on the project, very much. The reference is very dear to me. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, in the project of the housing development in Harlem, yes. 2015, yes. I've noticed that the grid of the windows from the outside is shifted. Yep. From the inside, it might, uh, wouldn't it create a discomfort for the people living in the houses? Uh -huh. And what was the, the grid based on? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there was that was very good. I love Very, very good question. <laughs> We, we had a community um, discussion about this, actually. We actually presented it to the community because the city said exactly what you said. W won't this confuse the citizens? Um, and we said, hmm, we don't think so. One, there two, there's two things that were at play. The social housing, the poor housing of New York is on a very tight technical grid. And the image to the community is these towers with these grids of cellular systems as the kind of skies of Skyways of, you know, they're sky prisons as they call them. I said I wanted to not repeat this on a project which is the same cost as the social housing. I wanted to create a different system. But I said I wanted to use a system which is maybe like a, it's not real, it's like a, I call it a jazz grid. But basically it's a two step. It's one, two, one, two, drop, one, two, one, two, drop, one, two, one, two, drop. So I'm also trying to speak to the heritage of that area. Duke Ellington played there. This is like the place where all this incredible jazz started. So it's a kind of staccato that's a jazz staccato. But it's also trying to talk about this idea of, you know, originally what we did is we even had a very low window. I had like a four part system. But the city stopped us because they were so scared that in case anything happened with a low window for children, you know, they would be blamed. But there was basically, the way the windows worked was that you had an adult window, a framing window, and a child window in each space. And when we showed it to the community, they overwhelmingly chose that to them, not, rather than two or three windows. It was unanimous. And also with the color, black, which everybody says, oh, you chose the color. We chose four colors. We had beige, we had white, and we had black. And overwhelmingly, they chose the black one. So it was, I just put it to the, uh, you know, I, I, of course I prefer the darker color, but I said, it's, it's not my choice, it's your building. So that was also put out to them. And what was interesting is that I talked about this notion of wanting to create a building that was going to work with this effect of this pattern. And, that, and, and they really understood it when you explained it to the community, and they preferred the narrative of this hidden pattern that becomes revealed more than just an illuminated pattern that's always there. So sometimes the public is more sophisticated than you realize, I think, if you explain. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> well, in the case of that building, I also think it's incredibly powerful. If you put together the, an image of the outside in the city and then the space inside, especially the public space inside, yeah. the contrast is yeah. so powerful. It's incredibly interesting, I think, extremely interesting. So I have a couple of questions. One is a technical question. I didn't understand which material uh, you use for the museum, for the skin in the Washington Museum. And the second question is a philosophical question. What is the relationship between the life, the duration? What is the relation over time for an architect, for a contemporary architect and your works? Because you have worked on small projects for private people and then such an institutional job as the Washington Museum. What's your idea about your buildings in the future, eternity, <laughs> a certain time. Oh, I, see. I mean, what's your idea of the duration of your buildings? Um, I don't start with the duration. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think that's important because um, a couple of things. The, the, oh, you, got, you, said, you said about the aluminum, right? Yeah, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the materiality, for the technical question before we come to the philosophical, the, tech, the aluminium is, 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 is cast aluminium. So it's recycled old aluminium, 
cast to create this. And the reason we were almost going to, we wanted to originally use bronze, but it, was, it became technically so complicated, not in terms of the ability to do it, but because basically the Smithsonian insisted on a 50 year minimum guarantee on that facade, which no company anywhere in the world would do. We got the maximum was something like 25 years from one company. But no company will guarantee a facade for 50 years. So we couldn't guarantee a bronze mechanical fixing with movement in it for 50 years. If I'm telling you that, because you're architects, so you need to know. So we couldn't do that facade in the end to give the guarantee to the federal government. And the way to do it was to lighten the weight of the thing. So I then went to a recycled aluminium, which I thought, okay, let's embrace the hybridity of the 21st century. Let's not, let's not fight it. And let's use an alloy to coat it to give us the guarantees. So with the aluminium and the fixing systems, the company said, technically, if nothing except for God striking it with lightning, it should be fine. <laughs> and, the, and basically, the Smithsonian accepted it. The so there is a connection between the two questions. Yes, totally. <laughs> totally. I don't, start, I don't start from weight. <laughs> I'm, I'm, with the work, I think that for me, the work is first about ideas. I am, I am very interested in how that, I, I firmly believe that in the end, you know, in my work, there is a kind of monumental quality to it, which I'm very interested in. But at the same time, I'm not interested in, in it as a kind of ruin. It is not a ruin. It is an active system for the society that it finds itself in. And if it finds itself disappearing, so be it. But for me, the architecture has to perform because in a way for me, I see the architecture as, uh, without sounding, absolutely sounding philosophical, as an evolutionary tool. Simply that. Can we, can we ask, I mean, I do this for the <laughs> like a global question. I mean, what will be the role of architecture for Africa in the future? What, Af what architecture will mean and can be for Africa in the future? It's, it's so important for the continent. I think that what is, what is going to be interesting to watch about Africa is that um, because of a lot of technological jumps, I think you're going to see another kind of city. I think that Asia really picked up on the city of the late 20th century, that it really manifested what America started but didn't finish. And really, if, if the American project went to its end game, it would be Asia. Yeah. So in a way, the Asian city is the end game of the 20th century thinking. And I think Africa, already in the thinking, is thinking about what the 21st century city is. Because the notion of what is the edge and the middle is already being challenged in urban terms. There's a lot of discussions going on about master planning satellite cities, which are being can canceled and countered, because this is no longer understood as a model, because infrastructure does not work that way. But also, we, have, we are in the age of the internet. And we are in the age of telecommunications, where now, in Africa, a village which was so remote yeah. speaks to the city more dynamically than you speak to your friends, probably. So there's a completely new network and connection that's happening, which architecture has to understand. So there's a way in which I think architecture can work in, this, in the continent, which I think will maybe make a, a new kind of urbanism when it's done well, because the conditions are correct for it. And the climate is so extreme that I think that architecture can become very, you know, what, what they don't, what I love about not having too much money in Africa, which Dubai has, is that you could, when it has too much money, you use the technology of architecture to deny the environment. When you don't have enough money, you have to respect the environment so that the, the respect of the environment creates a more unique architecture in the end, which for me is more preferable than the other way around. I don't want to make a spaceship to land on Mars and live in an oxygen tank. I want to make a building that lives in the climate and allows me to kind of have my habitation and my life within it, technologically. No, this, is, this is incredibly, I think, centered. <laughs> incredibly interesting also because we do see some you know, international architects or even Italian architects that keep going to Africa thinking they're in Dubai. It's like and so and uh, that would be a big mistake. I big think. mistake. <laughs> so, but what you said now for me is extremely, extremely relevant. Great. Thank you. There are more questions? We can, yes. I have. 
Hi. Hi. Two questions, actually. Great. The first is more um, is focused on uh, the, the few projects you showed. So um, I can't remember the, the name. I apologize. That's but <laughs> the first in the east side of London, and then the library in the east side of uh, Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. and uh, Manhattan in uh, sorry uh, Harlem in uh, in your city. Uh, so. Mm, okay, so you took, let's say, you took architecture in the dark side of the cities, mm -hmm. because actually these are the, the, the bad sides <laughs> of, of, each, of each city. Yeah. And so, ha, did, did uh, your projects, architectures, uh, create a social transformation of the size of the, of the suburbs, I mean, or, or the city? Yeah. And then the second question is a tricky question, actually. So I know that you, uh, you took inspiration from nature, from historical literature, and so on. But I also heard that you, you do love music. Yeah. And so if it's true, I just want to ask you uh, which, is the best, which is the song that best represents the, <laughs> the National Museum in, uh, of African of African, American African architecture in the sea. <laughs> Thank you. I, I may add on this question. Uh, besides that, you know, uh, David and his brother Peter, who's a musician, yes. did a performance yes. together in our museum. Yeah. But also, regarding your first question, uh, David didn't show today, but he had an important role in a series of library projects in London, the Idea Store, which were very much about the role of architecture in creating, no? also totally. communities, not only interacting. Prego. Yeah. No, it's really funny because it's, it's what's been very much learned is that how little architecture is required to produce a change in a community. It's, it's been fascinating. There's this belief that somehow you need a lot, but actually you need a few examples which lifts the game and shifts the, the scenario. Just in the East End, I, the, the dirty house, the first house, was not meant to be an icon. It was not meant to be a statement. It was actually meant to be hiding from the city, in a way, disappearing backwards. It, it, all its energy was invisibility, only to be pushed right to the front of uh, the thing. And in a weird way, it's, it's become the kind of image of that area. People Go, I mean, still my clients complain. I said this is a good luxury. You know, they complain that every time they open their window, there's somebody with a camera <laughs> sort of taking a picture at the front of the house, even to this day, um, which um, was not the intention at all. Um, yes, I am very interested in, I, you know, if you listen, like when I talked about the fact that the building had a kind of uh, common generality, a sort of superficiality or kind of useless quality, but actually to try and transform that. I am interested in what you think is not important. Um, I'm interested in architecture that redefines that. And I'm interested in that because I think that that has the greatest potential of change, really. Um, and I also want that because I want the, the way in which we look at the way in which the city and uh, how it operates not to be hierarchical, because I think that we do that as architects to our detriment. <laughs> we don't see the opportunity of other th conditions. And we think that it's only about one thing. And actually, I think that the, the monument might be not where you think it is. The monument of the 21st century might not be where you think it is, if you're looking only in one place. So I'm always trying to find you know, different places, sometimes successful, sometimes not. Yeah. Music. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> my brother does the music. I don't do the music. Um, I listen to music a lot, but I don't have a score yet for this building. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I listen to music a lot. Music is very important to me. And in my studio, we have a, a Sonus. Um, we have this crazy thing in the studio which people notice when they come. But we have a live jukebox between the desks. So people just upload their music from every desk and it plays through the day. So we're, we're constantly um, live uh, DJing in the office. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is, that, is that all? Can we? I have, also, I have to thank again uh, David, because in this series of lectures we are meeting very different people, no? From like extremely silent Japanese, to people who do one-man show, 
no, on, on the stage, no, like, you, you know, our Dutch friends, for instance. Or, but in this case, we have really an opportunity to attend a lecture, and it's the second time in three days that I see it, lectures that then come, they spill into discussions that are extremely, extremely positive and extremely good for the young people that it's here. So we have to thank you also for this format, which I think is very, very good for our, for our project. Grazie. And also the diversity is nice, of course. But anyway, congratulations. Thank Grazie. You. David. <clears throat> We want also uh, thank you for your contribution and for your activities that uh, is a really a very fundamental elements to make innovation through architecture. Why it is the way, the first way to communicate to everybody how much is important uh, the respect of the ambience and the, and the innovation, also with the very old material, very simple material. Thank you a lot to you. Thank you. We come to give you the oh, gift. Wow. This one is Ron the Arad. pizza, Ron Arad, <laughs> exactly. Fantastic. <laughs> there, is a, there is a quote. It's just to remember this uh, meeting thank and oh. thank you for uh, your thank time. You. Thank you a lot. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alex. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you. 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 Thank you.